Hello, and welcome to the Brutal Iron Gym Podcast, where our goal is to cut through the BS and deliver the brutal truth about topics related to health and happiness. Today's podcast number 2085, the topic is training, and the title is, What is the Best Eccentric Speed? Ooh, that's a fun question. (laughs) So when we think of a repetition, when we're doing a repetition of something, and we're going to use bicep curls because it's universally usually a pretty easy example. (laughs) Everybody has seen or is aware of a bicep curl. Uh, Typically, we would start the bicep curl in what would be considered a full extension. Now, I want to touch on some of the nerdy details, but not get too lost on the nerdy details. But when we think of creating muscular growth, so the discussion today is what is the best eccentric speed? We're going to be focused on muscle growth. Important towards muscle growth is muscle activation, meaning the muscle has to be active. It's it's actively resisting or controlling the weight load of the exercise. So in a bicep curl, if I have my arm just hanging down, if I'm holding onto a dumbbell, but if I'm literally just letting my arm hang, what that that's an inactive position, meaning my bicep isn't active against the weight load. The weight's actually kind of pulling through the connective tissues between the bones and the connective tissues of the muscles. So when we start a repetition and in between each repetition, when we get to the bottom, we want to stay in an active position, but we want a full extension of the active position. Meaning, I want to allow my bicep muscle to extend as far as it possibly can right before I would lose tension into the connective tissues. So I don't want to do a bicep curl where I'm just curling the first, like, th- like the top three inches. You know, somebody's trying to curl something that's too heavy for them, and they're doing a, just a short little range of motion curl up at the top of the bicep curl. You do want to get a, a good full extension, but we don't want to actually release tension on the muscle between each repetition. This would be like if I was using a machine, and I let the weight stack of the machine touch between every single repetition. <laughs> if it touched between every repetition, I'm losing muscular tension, muscular activation, and therefore I'm actually allowing the muscle to relax or I'm reducing stress on the muscle. So in order to get a muscle to grow, we don't want to reduce stress, we want to maximize stress. Therefore, at the full extension, we're actually talking about a full active extension. So that's when we start a repetition. Then, as we would curl upwards, we are doing the concentric portion of the movement. The concentric is when we're contracting the muscle against weight load. And then when we're at the top of the concentric, we're at the peak contraction phase. So the first phase is full extension, but it's an active extension. The second phase is the concentric, when we're moving the weight and we're creating a contraction under weight load. The third phase is the peak contraction. So my muscles as flexed as it can be. Then the fourth phase, the last phase, is the eccentric, which is when we're extending the muscle under weight load. So that would be when we're lowering the dumbbell back down in a bicep curl. And then you would return to the full active extension position and you start the next repetition. So those are the four phases of a repetition. You have the full active extension position. You then are going to contract, so that's the concentric portion. You have the peak contraction phase. And then you have the extension or the eccentric phase. So those are the four phases of a repetition. This is important for us to know for today's question, which is what is the best eccentric speed to answer what the hell is an eccentric? (laughs) So if that was a question you had, now you know. So the eccentric is the, the extending portion when you're under weight load, but you're allowing the muscle to actively extend. So the muscle is moving, the weight is moving, but it's moving under weight load in an extending fashion. That's the eccentric. Now that we have that, Crossed. We're good to go there. So today's podcast topic came from a YouTube viewer. They had a question. I have this year, I have tried to put a renewed effort into posting on YouTube. And the reason why I say a renewed effort is I've 
kind of intermittently, randomly done it over the years, but I never really spent, uh, never did it as like a primary focus. It was just whenever I felt like making a video and I thought it was fun, I would just make a video and post it. So I've been on YouTube since I think 2008, <laughs> and I've posted a lot in the early years of the gym. Then I just got busy training clients, never really pushed it a lot. I then got into social media via uh Instagram, and then from Instagram, you can share directly onto Facebook, and then directly onto Twitter. So I don't even go onto Twitter. I don't even know if my account's really active, but it's supposed to be supposedly sharing there. And then also on LinkedIn, the podcast shares directly to the LinkedIn. So that was the other thing I got into was the podcast. So when I was developing the business, social media wise, I was I don't I think I was present on Facebook, but I wasn't really paying attention to much Facebook. I got into Instagram, and Instagram has been kind of my main focus, and then the podcast became kind of a second focus, and now I want to add YouTube. So YouTube is one of the largest social media platforms, you know, in the world. So for me to have not used that at all <laughs> is a business faux pas, but the business has gone fine. I mean, it, it, you know, I'm very blessed, very lucky, knock on wood. Thank God. Thank you to all the listeners, supporters, clients. Uh, the business is good, so no worries there. But why not? You know, why not share more? And now that I've moved the business to my home, uh, we have this amazing, beautiful home gym. If you've seen any videos on Instagram recently in 2024, that's our home gym for Meredith and I. And it's been fun to create content. I do private content for clients. Uh, like showing them specific techniques for things that they're dealing with specifically for them. And then doing social media content, it's been fun now to dive into the world of YouTube and kind of grow that a little bit. So it was been kind of fun. I've been watching the analytics of YouTube throughout this year, and we now have over a 1,000 subscribers, responsible for 147 watch hours this past month, uh, so people have watched 147 hours of our YouTube videos <laughs> the last month, which I know for a lot of YouTube channels isn't anything, but for me, that's pretty freaking cool. That that sounds like a lot. <laughs> so I'm excited about that. In one of the recent videos I shared, it was two tips on how to improve your cable seated row technique. So I do share stuff that I don't talk about in a podcast and it's usually shared somewhere between Instagram and YouTube now, but anything longer than 90 seconds has to be on YouTube. And this video, for example, is 5 minutes and 14 seconds, talking about the tips on how to improve cable seated row technique. So if you're a listener of the podcast, but you don't check out our YouTube channel, I'll encourage you to do that. There's really good content there. We recently had a listener or a viewer on YouTube submit a question. Uh, like they made a comment on the video and I was super freaking excited. I, 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 I'm fired up. I love when people are engaged because that means somebody cared and somebody can be benefited from the information. So they asked the following question. I want to read through that and then I'll give you the response and then an extended explanation of the response. So their question. Uh, this video came across my feed. Good stuff. I like letting the shoulders extend forward to ensure full range of motion. I'm seeing a lot of talk about going slow on the eccentric on most movements. I suppose for time under tension purposes. And apparently the literature shows it helps stimulate hypertrophy, which is muscle growth, as opposed to all of these years of me simply keeping roughly the same pace of reps on both the concentric and eccentric parts of the movement. Robert. Do you have any strong opinions, one way or the other, about slow, controlled eccentrics? Again, really good video. So first of all, this like viewer knows a lot. <laughs> Very intelligent person. So they've clearly been trained for a long time. They know the words hypertrophy, concentric, eccentric, all that stuff. Uh, so I can't really see much on their YouTube profile, but they look like they're in really good shape. And they're a lawyer, uh, which I'm assuming they, they understand the benefits of being in good physical condition for business. And that's absolutely true. Uh, so very educated listener here, uh, viewer. I keep saying listener, but, but I guess YouTubes are viewers, not listeners. Um, awesome question. Loved it. Loved it, loved it, loved it, loved it. So I got fired up and excited, so I wrote in an answer. And I want to read through my answer. It has a, It's a long answer, especially for YouTube. So I want to break it down and kind of talk about it as I go through it. 
My response, hi Jason, so his name is Jason, thank you for the engagement in asking my opinion. I have also seen slash heard and read the research supporting the benefits of controlling the eccentric phase to increase muscle damage, thus muscle growth potential. So a little side note, I do read peer-reviewed research articles uh, all every month. I still have subscriptions to all the fancy pants ones uh, from when I used to teach at the university. I really love that stuff. It's nerdy, dorky things, but they're really fun. And um, it's just cool to see on top of the research. But the research is usually behind what people do in the gym. <laughs> so it's kind of funny is there's things we've been doing in the gym uh, for decades that then research has done and said like, hey, that works pretty well. And you're like, no shit. <laughs> but there are also things that research can show uh, that can give you like a, a broader viewpoint and understand that maybe there are more options, more ways to quote unquote skin the cat uh, to get things done. And um, the research on uh, controlled, extended, slowed, whatever you want to use term eccentrics is, is showing that that is actually true, that you can create uh, greater muscle growth stimulus through slow controlled eccentrics to a certain point. So um, so that's what I wrote back so far. <laughs> then the next thing I said, for clients, I asked that they eliminate momentum during the eccentric phase. And one way of teaching that is if I were to say stop. At any moment during the eccentric phase, they could pause the movement or at least significantly reduce the speed. So maybe they can't come to a complete stop, but they can significantly reduce that speed. And then in application for myself and clients, I find that there's a balance between extended eccentrics, which is kind of the term I use, slow eccentrics, extended eccentrics. Uh, all my clients, they've probably seen slow eccentrics in their program from time to time. Uh, so in application for myself and clients, I find there's a balance between extended eccentrics versus how a movement feels in regards to mind-muscle connection and rhythm. For me... I like slow eccentrics on most movements, such as hack squats, leg press, chest presses, bicep curls, etc. But I find that in some movements, such as lateral raises, overly restricting eccentric speed can too severely reduce potential weight load and or invites too much engagement of supporting muscles significant enough to reduce the mind-muscle connection of the working muscle. So, <laughs> to unpack that a bit, I, I do find that controlling the eccentrics in the sense of, if we're going to say what is a controlled or slowed eccentric compared to an uncontrolled or unslowed eccentric, that would be a good thing to discuss. So, how I would define that is, and this listener actually kind of hit on the same thing, the viewer hit on the same thing, is a, a normal repetition speed or tempo would have the eccentric match the same speed as the concentric. So the speed on the way in which you pulled up on a bicep curl, the speed of the contraction, if you matched that same speed on the eccentric, that would be considered a normal speed eccentric. So if on the eccentric you're slower than the concentric, that is technically a slow eccentric or an extended eccentric. Now, I'll exaggerate that even more, especially on bicep curls. Um, I find that that's one of the, the one of the exercises that benefits the most from a slowed eccentric because you really get enormous amounts of muscle damage, and um, that's the best, just the, oh, the bread and butter of a bicep curl is on the way down. So I'll curl up at like a one, two, but then I'll go down at one, two, three, four. So often on bicep curls, I use twice the time on the eccentric as I do in the concentric. I'll do the same thing on hack squats. I love feeling the hack squat be in control on the way down. Not only is it helpful for protection against muscle tears and hurting your knees or bouncing out of your joints at the bottom, but I'll do a four count on the way down on an eccentric on a hack squat. So the way down is like one, two, three, four. And then up might be one, two, boom. So I like that. I typically, when I consider myself doing a slowed or controlled eccentric, uh, it's going to be typically at the rate of twice the time as the concentric. 
I find that that is as slow as you need to go in order to maximize that benefit. That meaning like if you go, you know, is slower even better? Should I go three times the concentric speed or four times the concentric speed? So if the concentric is two count, should I go an eight count eccentric? Uh, no. Um, what I found in my lifting with all my clients, uh, you know, beginner, intermediate, advanced, and I'm, I train, you know, IFBB pros, natural card pros, elite level powerlifters, uh, D1 athletes, I've trained professional athletes, Olympic athletes. Uh, and so beginner all the way to advanced is that twice the concentric speed is a good enough slowed eccentric. If you go beyond that, you're actually doing, this is going to sound weird, but you're doing a slow release isometric. <laughs> um, what in the hell that means, <laughs> to unpack that a bit, actually is discussed a little bit in a recent podcast. If you want to learn a little bit more, is podcast 2083. So just two podcasts ago, it was a Q&A podcast titled Strength vs. Growth the impact of peak contraction hold length. I discuss isometrics and their place in training and then how they're different than eccentrics and concentrics. So an isometric contraction is a muscle contraction without movement. So if I were to curl the dumbbell halfway up and just stop, that stopped portion, that time under tension where I'm stopped, is called an isometric. An isometric is primarily best for strength development. And it primarily develops strength only at that joint angle, plus or minus 10%. So if I pause my joint angle at 90 degrees, I'm going to, make, I'm going to increase my strength uh, from 80 to 100 degrees. It doesn't mean that I necessarily am improving my strength at full extension or full contraction, it would be related to what degree, what angle of that joint I pause and do the isometric at, plus or minus 10, 10 degrees. Now, since an isometric is more so a strength developer, not a muscle growth developer, you don't want to use isometrics as a primary kind of tool or technique when your goal is muscle growth. What happens with an eccentric when you control the speed too severely and you make it too slow, it turns more into a, a loose, kind of lazy isometric, meaning you're getting more of a strength-based response than you're getting that muscle damage response. If you move too slow, it doesn't really cause as much damage because the weight now is, is sub-maximal in the sense that it can't be a maximal weight load if you're moving it that damn slow. So if you can move something and control the, con like after the concentric is two count, one, two, and then you're doing like an eight count eccentric, that is not a maximal weight load. You're not going to move something that's damn near one rep max for an eight count eccentric, or even a six rep max, or an eight rep max, or a 10 rep max. So what ends up happening is, is if you over control the eccentric load, you're, you're, true weight load regards to intensity has to decrease too much and you're not getting a muscle growth a muscle damage response because the weight is no longer heavy enough so for me to do like say an eight count eccentric maybe i can only curl a 15 pound dumbbell but if i do a, a four count eccentric now all of a sudden i can do like a, a 20 or 25 pound dumbbell that extra weight load is going to be more beneficial towards muscle damage than the extra eccentric time under tension so there becomes a balance between what is too slow of an eccentric that is no longer producing growth because it's no longer producing damage versus what is a controlled enough eccentric that you're maximizing the muscle damage, therefore maximizing the growth. So what I would recommend is that the slowest your eccentrics ever go is twice the speed of the concentric. Now, that is a far deviation from the answer that I gave on YouTube, but I wanted to come back and expand on my answer, and I'm actually going to tag this viewer in today's podcast when it comes out on YouTube. So all of our podcasts are on uh, popular podcast platforms, and they're also now available on YouTube as well. So I will tag his name, uh, YouTube name, in that uh, post when it posts online. So that way he can hear and maybe learn more details as to what I could give than just that answer on uh, YouTube. So going back to my answer, 
I also feel that being overly rest- overly strict with eccentrics can reduce strength progression, which is often helpful for mu- future muscle growth potential. So that is referring back to if I over control the eccentrics, I'm, I'm lessening the weight that I'm lo- using, lessening the weight load, and therefore I'm not getting, I'm not only am I not getting the growth potential, but I'm also not even getting strength potential, uh, which is then long-term investment for growth. So I'm not going to get stronger, I'm not going to get bigger, I'm just holding this weight for a stupidly long amount of time. Uh, so there becomes too strict or too extended of eccentrics. And again, I believe, and my experience with clients has shown, that that becomes when you're greater than two times the concentric speed. So when performing multiple working sets, this is how I kind of blend uh, everything together, is I usually will have an extended controlled eccentric on the first one or two working sets. So maybe I'll have a two times the concentric speed on my eccentric for the first one or two working sets. But then, as the muscle fatigues, as I'm creating more damage, I'll allow the eccentric phase to quote unquote speed up to match the concentric phase on the final one or two working sets. This allows me to maintain a heavy weight load even as the muscle fatigues, so therefore I'm still producing a a maximal and beneficial uh, muscle growth response rather than having to reduce weight load to maintain the eccentric speed but then no longer getting the damage I want because now the weight load is too light. So in all sets, I want the eccentric to be controlled So my muscle is resisting movement. I'm not allowing the weight to just fall. I do want to have some guided effort, some degree of guided effort in my eccentric. But on my beginning sets, my first couple working sets, I might have a two time the concentric speed as my eccentric speed. And then as the muscle fatigues, I'll go ahead and reduce it to a one to one ratio and have that match. That I find gets the best blend of the extended eccentric time under tension for muscle growth potential benefits, but blending that with real world application and not losing the uh, big picture goal by chasing down this small picture technique component. So hopefully that was helpful and interesting to hear. It might be a little bit uh, kind of like nuanced and detailed, but I love this stuff. I I think this stuff is super beneficial. It's very helpful to know because the longer you train, the more these little things matter and the more these little things can help push and produce greater results, even if you've been training for, you know, decades. Uh, This is one of my favorite things is when I work with clients who are already elite level powerlifters or they're already a high national level aesthetic competitor, this is how I help them move to the next level. They often already have a lot of the basics down. However, there's almost always something in nutrition that we can clean up. So I'll help them clean up that nutrition component. And then when it comes to training, these are those little nuancey things that starts to push them to that next level. So these things do matter And especially the further into progress that you want to get into, the more you want to push the results, the smaller things matter more and more. Awesome. So that would be the recommendation I have for podcast listeners. Uh, If you want to maximize the growth potential of your eccentrics on your first working sets, take two times the amount of time it takes to do the concentric. Have that as your eccentric speed. And then each working set, you can speed up that eccentric uh, eventually to match the concentric speed. And that'll help you maximize the benefits of controlled eccentrics for muscle growth. Awesome. So hopefully that was interesting. Hopefully that was fun. Uh, If anybody has any questions, any follow-up stuff, just shoot me a message on our website, www.brutalironjim.com. You can scroll to the bottom of the homepage. There's a contact form there, and you can send me any message you want at any time. I'll answer you back within two weeks. And then if you like the podcast, please share the podcast. The more we share the podcast, the more people we can help with the podcast. If you share it on social media, that's the best way to reach the most amount of people. But even just sharing it word of mouth. If somebody ever asks you a question about nutrition or training, just let them know that the podcast exists. I encourage them to check it out and let them know that I also will answer any questions they have for free. I'll make them podcast for free. Just the more people that know about it, the more people will be helped by it. 
If you like the podcast, you can also consider donating to support the podcast, which you can do on our website. And if you like the information we share in the podcast, you can find more from us on our social media channels. You can find us and follow us on Instagram and YouTube under the name Brutal Iron Jim. As always, I hope this was helpful, and thank you for listening.